Um, my name is Kate and this is Hazel and we're part of the Back to the Bays initiative of Cornell Cooperative Extension's um, Marine Program. And a big part of what we do is things like this, education. It's a major part of our work. It's not that we, we do the science and then we communicate that science to the public and um, offer stewardship sessions. And today, Hazel is going to talk all about horseshoe crabs. It is the season, coming up on the season, that they're coming up onto shore for mating, right? Yeah. And uh, we're going to learn all about that. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yeah, I'll tell them about that, too. Um, so as you, some of you know, I'm Hazel. I'm also the volunteer coordinator, so I'm usually the one kind of introducing these things, trying to balance all of it today. Um, so make sure afterwards that you sign in if I didn't get you already, because um, we want to make sure that we have you know, a record of everybody who's here and got to participate. Um, and you can definitely take a look at all of our flyers and everything afterwards as well. Um, I'm hoping to keep today a little bit interactive. So as a teacher, I actually really love it when my class you know, asks me questions during a presentation. So don't be shy. Um, some of the questions might get answered later, and I might tell you that. But um, as we go, you know, feel free to make comments and, and, uh, and ask questions. Um, and we'll keep it interactive. And um, certainly at the end, you guys will get to come up and, and see some of the equipment we use to help monitor this population and hopefully sign up to get involved with us, which would be awesome. All right. So let's get going. Horseshoe crabs are living fossils. So some of you may have heard them called that before. Um, and it easily confuses people. They think that they're dinosaurs or that they lived around the same time as dinosaurs because that's what we learn about as kids, dinosaurs, fossils, things that are ancient and extinct. But they are amazingly still around today and they are way, way older than dinosaurs. So horseshoe crabs evolved about 450 million years ago. It's an amount of time that almost none of us can conceptualize. Um, it was, this was the Paleozoic era. This was sort of the big explosion of, of organisms around our planet. Um, so they were, they were here through some of the first times of life on our planet. There was a period of time when they were six feet wide. They were ancient, extinct species that were really big. So they lived through a period of time where um, the oxygen levels on our planet happened to be higher than they are today. So things like dragonflies were this big, centipedes, you know, and horseshoe crabs. They got really, really big. Still, way before the dinosaurs. Um, and believe it or not, trilobites are one of their closest uh, relatives of these extinct species. But follow this line here. This kind of crescent shape is very, very similar to the horseshoe crab. So these guys simplified things. They only have three parts to their body, which we're gonna get into, whereas trilobites had many, many segments. But they did share a lot in common, and trilobites ruled the earth at one point. They did not make it till today. So the horseshoe crabs must have done something right. So just to get some more perspective on how long ago 450 million years is. <laughs> some of us don't like to think about time <laughs> passing. Um, but it might make us feel really young, because humans have only been here for about one second, if you think about it on a clock. That's how long humans have been on this planet, one second. Horseshoe crabs, maybe about an hour, two hours, okay? And a huge amount of the time on a clock, if you're thinking about that analogy, there was no life here, um, or very, very simple bacteria. So 450 million years ago, there were almost no land plants at all, really not much happening on land whatsoever. We had no complex land animals, for sure. Everything was happening in the oceans. Um, arthropods and mollusks were very, very common. So arthropods are anything that has this hard shell that we're going to talk about and jointed appendages. Um, mollusks are things like octopus and clams, snails, squishy soft bodies, and uh, usually a shell. So that was mostly what the ocean was filled with. Um, and the dinosaurs, for comparison, will not appear for another 200 million years. So that is how long horseshoe crabs lived before they even got to see a dinosaur. I know dinosaurs, cool, right? Horseshoe crabs, cooler, in my opinion. Um, and just for some other comparison, the first Homo sapiens, so modern humans, appeared just 200,000 years ago. So a fraction of the time 
that these guys have lived on this earth. So pretty impressive species. They must have, they must have gotten something right. And for, for something that is not a vicious predator, it's not going out and hunting things and you know, controlling other species, they're scavengers. They just roam around on the bottom, but there's something right about this shell that must have really protected them. And, and their immune system is amazing as well. I have seen horseshoe crabs that have, they must have gotten hit by something or maybe even stepped on um, that have like a chunk taken out of their shell, including one of their eyes. It's all healed up and they're walking around. I don't know how they're doing it. Um, <laughs> they just have amazing abilities to heal. And uh, yeah, there's actually, we're still trying to figure out, whoops, how old um, the oldest horseshoe crabs are. We don't actually know that. So more science to be done. For some more perspective, um, because I just, I like thinking about this, the whole history of life on Earth. Um, if you've ever heard of Pangaea, which was the big super continent, so around here, right, all the continents sort of fit together like a puzzle. Um, horseshoe crabs were around for the formation of that, when all those continents collided with each other, and they stayed around to watch them split apart and form the Atlantic Ocean. So you can see way, way long ago, doesn't look anything like today. Everything collided, and then a shift happened, and they started pulling apart, forming this nice ocean in the middle. So our Atlantic horseshoe crab would have evolved after the Atlantic Ocean formed. So they saw a lot of changes on our planet. So the question is, what is a horseshoe crab? And the first one I'm gonna ask is, is it a crab? Now, I'm gonna show you three things here, and I want you to tell me if you think it's a crab. Is that a crab? Can you even see it? Let's see if I can zoom in. Nope, can't. It's a scorpion, yep. Is a scorpion a type of crab? No, right, not a crab. Okay, is a horseshoe crab a crab? I'm calling it a crab? Logical, right? Okay, let's see. Is that a crab? That's definitely a crab, right? Which of these things do you think looks more similar, if you can see it? <laughs> That's a good point, right? The crab's tail is actually tucked up under its belly. It has a totally different purpose for, for holding onto its eggs, whereas the scorpion has this long tail. Horseshoe crab has it too. Somebody else, I heard you point out the legs, right? A lot more sort of legs sticking out on these, the hor uh, horseshoe crab and the scorpion. So, I'll, I'll spoiler. The crab, the blue crab over here, which many of you probably have eaten, if you've had soft shell crab, that is indeed a crab. It's called a true crab. Um, the scorpion is uh, more closely related to spiders. And the horseshoe crab is actually closer to this direction. So a horseshoe crab is not, in, not a crab at all. We call it a crab um, because it lives in the ocean and it has a bunch of legs. Um, and it's similar to the other crabs in that they are arthropods. They have those jointed appendages. They have the shell but they're very distantly related from the other crabs out there. So, their closest relatives of a horseshoe crab are spiders and scorpions. Um, to get a little bit more technical with the science here, uh, the kingdom that we are part of as well is the animal kingdom. Um, and their phylum is arthropods, as I said, those jointed appendages, a shell. Another common thing with this uh, phylum is that they shed their shell. Right? So it's kind of like their skeletons on the outside. It doesn't grow with them. They have to shed it and leave it behind. Talk about that. Um, and believe it or not, horseshoe crabs are in their own class. There are no other uh, species on Earth that uh, fit in that group. So their closest relatives that we know of are the scorpions, but um, they've been given their own special group because they are so unique. It's called Merostomata. There are only four species of this worldwide. Um, and our uh, current one here, the Atlantic horseshoe crab, is the scientific name is Limulus polyphemus. Um, and there's a little bit more evidence here of why horseshoe crabs are so closely related to scorpions if you look at their, um, how they breathe. So uh, we have some, let's see if this one has it. This one's missing its gills. It's hard to find them that have their gills on it. Um, but the horseshoe crabs, have uh, gills that are like in little stacks, almost like the pages of a book. They're called book gills. So if you took a cross section of their gills, it would look like, you know, the stack of a book sitting up on a shelf. If you look at the lungs of a spider, 
or a scorpion, which have now moved from the ocean to live on land and breathe air, they have a very, very similar structure, and we call them book lungs. So all these nice little folds to increase the surface area for getting oxygen. All right, I know this is gonna be really hard to see in here, um, so maybe I'll point some of these things out. The, the basic anatomy of a horseshoe crab, um, you know, we think of this as the head. It is technically called the protostoma. Um, it's a little bit different than the body of a crab. So we look at like a blue crab um, and they have kind of their middle body not separated from their head. Um, these guys are very different. They do have two compound eyes up here. Compound eyes are the same throughout the arthropods. Um, and what it means, like if you were to look at a, a fruit fly or any kind of fly, a bug under the microscope and look at their eye, you'll see hundreds of smaller eyes all working together. It almost looks like the pixels on a computer screen that are working together to make an image for you. Um, and they have those same kind of eyes here. So two eyes, just like we have, but they also have more eyes. They have a whole bunch of invisible light sensors around the front of their, their um, head here. Um, and these ones can make an image, so they could actually see you. The light sensors are really responsible for telling um, the phase of the moon, which we're going to talk about, is how they know when the best time to come out and, and reproduce is. Um, so they can tell the length of the day, the phase of the moon, so just basic kind of light changes. Um, if this were alive, you'd see that there's a hinge here, so it would be able to move here. Um, probably the most, the easiest place to get hurt by a horseshoe crab is just accidentally putting your finger in there. It's not that bad. <laughs> These guys are really, really gentle creatures um, because their tail, which is called a telson, here's another really big one I found the other day. Um, you guys can come up and, and touch it later if you want to. It's actually triangular if you look down it. Um, and the whole purpose of this, a lot of people think it looks like a stingray and that if you step on it, it's going to get you with its tail or that maybe there's some toxins in here. Not at all. They are so gentle, nice creatures. Um, the tail is literally just to flip themselves over. So if they wind up on their back, remember they're coming in to the shore all the way up to the high tide. So the waves might be crashing and they get tossed around. They get flipped on their back all the time. So what they do is they dig their tail into the sand, roll onto their side, and they can flip themselves over. If a horseshoe crab loses its tail, which is very easy to do if you accidentally pick it up by its tail or on purpose, so never ever hold a horseshoe crab by the tail. It will really hurt. It will be like somebody picking you up by your arm as a full-grown adult. You're going to dislocate your shoulder. It's not going to be good. Okay. Um, on the, let's see, anything else on the top? These spines here also, you know, probably just for protection from predators. They don't hurt. They don't have any venom in them. On the underside of a horseshoe crab, um, you've got the mouth right in the middle. Um, it's kind of like a crunching mouth. Um, I could put my finger in here in a, a live crab and it will not hurt me. And all of their legs, you can see with their tiny little pincers, they all lead to their mouth. So they're scavengers, anything they kind of come into contact with, a bit of algae, something decomposing, sometimes live, um, you know, little crabs and snails and things like that. They feed it into their mouth and those crunching parts, you know, break up the shells. Um, on females, this whole top part, is a little bit bigger uh, once they're fully mature. And that's where they hold their eggs. They actually hold their eggs like all up in their face here. It's a strange place to hold your eggs. Very different from a regular crab, which lays its eggs and holds them on their belly using their tail. Um, so she'll develop all these eggs in here. And then when they crawl onto the shore, they dig their face into the sand and deposit the eggs into the sand so that they can develop. Um, what else? Did I miss anything? Oh, the lung, the, the gills I talked about are down here. You'll see on a live one that they, they kind of beat with the water to, to uh, move water over them. Um, so that's how they breathe. Um, and this one's a little bit damaged, but the, the back legs, like the very last pair in the back, have special fins on them that allow them to dig out the sand underneath them. So if the tide goes out suddenly and they didn't make it back, they can dig themselves in um, using those, those special feet uh, without having to move around too much. They just have to use those little paddles and uh, they can wait for the tide to come back in. 
So, like Kate said, this is the prime time to start going out and looking for horseshoe crabs. Um, this is their mating season, the beginning of their mating season. Um, and a lot of people are predicting, I think I'm already observing it myself, it's going to be early this year. It, it might peak very early because we've had such a mild winter. So they gather in huge swarms of horseshoe crabs thousands at a time on the beach to lay their eggs uh, between late June or late um, April and early July. Um, and the reason that they are, they, they do this partly, you know, seasonally because of the temperature, um, but they, they follow a lunar cycle. So when, if you want to guarantee that you want to see a horseshoe crab at the beach, you need to go at night and you need to go at high tide around this time. Um, and you, you want to aim for the new moon or the, the full moon. Um, and the reason for that is they're trying to get their eggs as far away from the fish predators as they can. Now they're going to accidentally get them a little bit closer to all the bird predators, which is great for the birds. But the whole goal here of laying your eggs up on a beach as a marine species is that you've been evolving away from <laughs> to hide your eggs from the marine predators. So the reason that the tides are better on the full and new moons, um, you have the highest high tides and the lowest low tides. And the reason for that is the pull of the gravity of the moon is actually working with the gravity of the sun. So most of our tides um, are caused by the gravitational pull of the moon on the water, right? So it actually pulls our oceans a little bit farther away from our planet, believe it or not. And we just spin through that. So this is called a tidal bulge. You're gonna see it on both sides because it's spinning, it gets sloshed to the other side. Um, so whether the moon is here and pulling this direction along with the sun's gravity, or the moon is over here and pulling this way, sun pulling that way, you get this um, sort of extra effect of, those, of both of those tidal pulls at the same time. Um, on quarter moons, where the moon would be here and here, they're gonna be kind of working against each other. So you still get a high and low because the moon is much, much closer to us. This sun, if I had to make this um, proportionate, I would have to put it way, way over there and make it way, way bigger, right? Um, so the sun still exerts a force because it's big, but not because it's close. <laughs> yeah, so, so the females will all lay eggs once they reach sexual maturity. And believe it or not, it's at about 10 years. Yeah, it's very late for a lot of marine species. Um, you know, we think about things kind of going through their life cycle pretty fast and <laughs> Uh, like think about like a monarch butterfly, also an arthropod, right? They, they lay eggs, hatch in about a couple of weeks, feed, you know, and they become an adult ready to move to the next, the next location um, in a few months. Right? So that's what we're trying to figure out with our tracking. Um, there does seem to be some site fidelity where they're coming back to the same beaches, um, but the program needs to keep, keep going. We have to look out for the tags, which I'm gonna get to shortly. Um, so yeah, all of that data is going to help answer some of those questions. All right, a little bit more about their life cycle. Um, when horseshoe crabs uh, hatch, they, are, they already look like a horseshoe crab. Um, this is also very kind of unique for this group, right? Think about insects that they go through these metamorphoses throughout their lifetime. Um, a lot of other marine critters, like a crab is born looking more like a lobster, a sea urchin is born looking more like a starfish, you know. They all kind of change throughout their life. Horseshoe crabs, once they hatch, they look like a horseshoe crab. And they're already kind of crawling around on the bottom. Um, they do have to uh, shed their exoskeleton, as I said. Um, it's called molting. Um, so different from like a snake shedding its skin. This is literally its, its protective skeleton. So once they do that, they are very vulnerable. So that's another reason to kind of bury themselves at that time. Um, and they do this about 16 or 17 times throughout their lifetime. The first, the first year or so, they will molt a handful of times, maybe seven or eight times, and then about once a year after that. Um, and like I just mentioned, at sexual maturity, um, the males are about eight years old, eight or nine. The females, we think about nine or 10. Um, again, it has been very difficult for us to figure out exactly how old a fully grown horseshoe crab is. Um, we think they, we know that they live to at least 20, but it could be 40, like we're really not sure. 
Um, there's not a, there's nothing we can take off of the shell and count the rings like a tree or like a fish scale or anything like that. We haven't figured that out. Yeah. When, when, they, when they shed the, the, the first layer, have they already formed another layer? Bigger? Good question. So they're, it's, it's starting to form, but they're, they're soft, right? So if you've ever eaten a soft shell crab, it is a blue crab that has just molted. That's the only reason that it's soft and you're able to, to crunch on their exoskeleton, because it hasn't fully formed all of those proteins to make it solid. So it kind of forces the upper layer yeah, it'll for it actually comes out right here, um, and it'll so its face will kind of crawl out first, and it's you know, it it somehow has this innate ability to feel that it's getting tight in there, right? Like that's how I imagine it anyway. That it must be feel like your clothes are too small and you have to crawl out of them, right? So you have to be soft enough to get out, hide under some sand, or like a lot of crabs will hide under a rock. Um, so that they don't get eaten by something during that time. Yeah. So that they come to shore just during this season? Pretty much. And yeah. where, so could they be in the bay, the sound? Yeah. Yeah, so they spend, they start when they're just kind of overwintering. They're actually, they'll go out of the bays all the way out into the deeper Atlantic Ocean. Um, not all the way to the shelf, but like definitely deep cold water. They kind of hunker down and go dormant for the for the winter, so they're not eating. Um, and then once the water temperatures do start to warm up, they get the cue. Um, you know, the season's changing. They come into the bays, so you can start to see them. You know, wandering around um, in eelgrass in the shallows. Um, they'll be out in the middle of our bays. Our bays are very shallow here anyway. <laughs> Um, and then they come to the shore in cycles over and over again throughout the season when these full moons happen. And it's not to say that they don't come and reproduce on a, on a half moon, you know, a quarter moon. Um, it just means that it's much more likely that you're going to see thousands of them at a time if it's on the, the lunar cycle. Um, so, and once they do this, once they lay their eggs there, they are fueling a huge ecosystem. Those eggs are really, really important for migrating shorebirds um, and anything that might dig in the sand to try to find um, a good food source. This is what their, their eggs look like. I don't know if you can see. These are fingers. So they're about the same size as like the head of a pin. Um, and again, they hatch out of that looking just like a, a regular horseshoe crab. Um, one female throughout the season will lay about 80,000 eggs. Um, multiply that by thousands at a time every time they come on shore. You know, it's, they're doing this over and over again. Yeah. Um, and I just learned this the other day. The, the males and females, so they pair up with each other and kind of latch on, which I realized I put that picture way too late in this. Let me show you guys um, what they look like when they are attached. And we'll get to this shortly. Right, so the females, which are much bigger, this was probably a female, right? Um, they will always be in the front, and then you'll see the male kind of attached in the back, and he holds on, I just found out, for the entire mating season. So once somebody gets hooked on to the female, they latch on with their front, front claws, that guy gets to stay there the whole time. Um, you will see lots of other males, called satellite males, kind of chasing them around. Um, and once the female digs in, lays her eggs, this male that was attached, you know, is going to get pulled along over it, kind of like a conveyor belt. He'll fertilize them, bury them up, and then they go on their way. And the satellite males that have been hanging around all this time, they actually have a 70% chance of fertilization. So it pays to hang around and see, see how lucky you get. Um, yeah, and they are kind of a hub in the food chain. They supply um, lots of, you know, fish, sanderlings, small, you know, this the razor clam, right? They're part of a really big um, ecosystem. And I could talk about lots of migratory birds that depend on them. <laughs> but the eastern red knot is well known to have, um, you know, become very, very dependent on these uh, horseshoe crab eggs. Um, the IUCN has designated them near threatened, which sounds like it's not that big of a deal, but just to get on the IUCN uh, red list as a uh, possibly endangered or threatened species is a big deal. Um, so 
another reason that protecting the horseshoe crabs as their food source for their eggs is really, really important. Um, these guys do a 10,000 mile migration here. Um, so they'll come from all the way up here, all the way down to this area. And uh, they need food along the way. Any migratory shorebird um, really depends on, on things like this. I'm gonna get to this point because we actually depend on them and we do use them for a lot of things, right? So our populations of horseshoe crabs have definitely declined due to human action. The two big things have been used as fishing bait um, as well as the biomedical industry. And I'm gonna uh, show you guys a little bit more about those things. So the two biggest uh, reasons that people collect them for bait are that they happen to be really good at uh, attracting whelk or the conch. Um, this is a, a fishery that just a couple years ago was, was finally regulated, so they, they didn't have any regulation on whelk. Now we do. Um, and we've actually seen that as the, as the whelk are regulated, <laughs> we are seeing less and less take of the horseshoe crabs, capture of horseshoe crabs for bait. So that was a really big impact. Um, you know, you can see um, trucks filled up with them. Um, they also were used to catch uh, American eels. So two really big industries um, that, that we need to keep this species around for. Um, there are some alternative bait programs that are going on to try to find replacements and stuff, but they just happen to be you know, the best thing for those, those industries right now. Um, so a good reason to, to manage them. The really big reason though is biomedical. We need their blood. And I'm gonna talk about their blood a little bit. So there's a special chemical in their blood um, that is able to, and this is part of their own immune system. So it's able to detect gram-negative bacteria, which is a huge category of bacteria. Um, and it does so by coagulating. It's believed that the horseshoe crabs use this compound in their blood to, um, as, as their main immune defense. They don't really have the same immune system that we do. They can't learn, you know, uh, like if we're exposed to something, our body learns um, you know, to, to attack that in the future. They don't have any of that. So they really rely on the chemistry in their body to help them heal. It's probably why you can see horseshoe crabs with that big chunk taken out of them because they're able to really prevent an infection. Um, and this is the FDA gold standard for how we detect bacteria in anything that is going to go in the human body. Every single vaccine that's ever been developed every hip replacement, every pacemaker, anything that's gonna go in the human body um, gets tested with a compound that is only found in horseshoe crab blood. Um, there is no approved substitute right now. I do believe there's probably some in the works, but as you know, it takes a long time for those things to get really tested and approved. Um, so something that we, we really, really owe them our lives, you know, our modern um, medical lives uh, for them. So, you know, I, when I first started conservation work, I used to think, when I was much younger, I used to think like, ah, oh, people are terrible, like we just need to get out of the way and just let nature take its course. Mm, 17, we'll go with that. Okay, when I was first starting out. And now, um, you know, I, I've really changed my mind. You know, we have, we are part of this place, right? We interact with things and we just need to find a balance, right? So the ability to manage a resource for ourselves so that they're there for the Eastern red knots, but also there for us, right? If you care about a bird, um, great. Some people are only gonna care about the vaccine, great. Maybe some people only care about the whelk fishing, right? But there's something for everybody. This species can be important to everybody, I believe. All right, and the way that they, that they take the blood for these things is that they, they harvest them, um, or people will harvest and, and ship them to a dealer. They bleed them, and then they release them. So they do actually uh, release a lot of them back. Their estimated reported uh, mortality in this is 15%, though, which is still pretty significant. Um, and we think that it could be as high as 30%, um, because there may be some that are not being reported fully. Did you have a question? So Yeah, so what are they doing? So they, this, this hinge that I told you about, right? So if you, bend a horseshoe, if you bend the horseshoe crab here, it exposes a really big vein right here. Um, and they, they will insert a needle, just like if you were giving blood, um, and collect the blood into these bottles. Um, I'm sure they've got some protocols for how much they can take from each crab before um, they have to release them. But 
that's a lot. <laughs> Just looking at this picture. But do you notice anything funny about their blood? Yes, it is blue. So the reason that horseshoe crab blood is blue is really different from ours. Um, they are using a totally different molecule to transport oxygen. It's called hemocyanin. So whereas humans use hemoglobin, um, which has iron in it, that's why they, you know, if you are low in iron, you feel very weak, um, lightheaded maybe, because your blood is not able to transport oxygen as well. But that iron makes our blood red, right? If you leave a piece of iron in the rain and the, the oxygen hits it, it turns rusty, red. Um, their blood is based in copper. So they have a tiny little uh, atom of copper in each of their um, hemocyanin molecules, and that allows the full picture of the molecule to come together and be able to transport oxygen around their body. Um, but like copper, when it oxidizes, like the Statue of Liberty or a, a copper penny, it turns that bluey green color. Yeah. Can they be uh, arranged artificially, like arms, like clams? Yeah, it has, it's a great idea. It hasn't been very successful so far. Um, and I think probably it has to do with the fact that they are so in tune with the moon and the light sensing, you know? They, they need that, that external environment. Like, for example, oysters and clams, when we um, spawn them in a hatchery, it's, it's temperature dependent. They're not sensing any sort of light change, really. Scallops can sense light, so that might, might have something to do with it. But um, yeah, the oysters and clams, you just have to raise and lower the temperature to trigger those those environmental cues, whereas the horseshoe crab, you know, it's relying on the moon. Um, who knows, they may also be sensing the magnetic poles of the earth. They might have a GPS built in there, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of mysteries in, in the animal world that we don't know exactly how they do it. Um, yeah, so now this brings us to the point of, you know, how do we actually manage this to keep, it, keep them around? Um, and this is uh, happening, I'm going to focus on New York, but this is happening up and down um, the East Coast. Um, the Chesapeake Bay, I believe, has closed a lot of it uh, to, to horseshoe crab taking. Um, but, you know, here we, we do things a little differently. We want to make sure that everybody has a chance to kind of contribute to the idea um, and that nobody's getting slighted their crabs. So the annual quota, um, these were set up uh, by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which regulates fisheries up and down the east coast of the U.S. And in 2000, um, they set the New York quota, among other places, at 366,272 crabs. Uh, there must have been a, a specific math formula there, and they just didn't round it or anything. It's a very specific number. <laughs> Um, New York State DEC actually elected to make this even more strict than the federal regulation. So in 2004, we decided as a state to voluntarily reduce our quota to 150,000 crabs per year. Um, and this is what that kind of looks like over the last few years. Um, so you can kind of see we're actually in a pretty good space right here. We're actually underneath um, our voluntary quota. <laughs> the, the federal one was way up here, right? So in New York, we are actually doing a lot um, to, to reduce the, the amount of crabs that get taken. Um, this is 2022, so we'll have to see what this, this year brings. Yes? Do they pay private citizens to collect crabs? Do they pay? Who's they? Well, to take them and bring them to laboratory. Yeah, so, so I guess those would be, you'd probably, you have to get permits just like for, with any other fishery. <coughs> Um, but anybody who wanted to become commercial, you know, and be able to sell that, yes, you could. There's a, there's a recreational limit, which is only five, I think it's five crabs per day. So that, you know, that's like what you could take as a scientist if you wanted to put them in your lab or just a recreation. But you can't sell them. It would be like if somebody is doing their own little bit of whelk fishing and they want to take five crabs for that. Um, yeah. You can only really harvest them when they hit the beach. Never seen anybody yeah, so that's that's the thing, right? And that, and that's the tricky thing about managing this is that the only time that people do make a living at at harvesting these crabs is right when they're reproducing, and that's it. So it's you know it's been difficult. Um, we you know the other thing that we really want to do is make sure that we have a way to count them, right? How many are out there? How many are we taking? Um, so I bring this up to kind of 
shed some light on the differences between two methods within all the fisheries, right? So there's, there's one way of counting how many are out there, which is to ask the fisheries how many they caught. With these guys, if it's, if it's for the biomedical research, they are releasing them mostly. Um, but with any kind of fishery where you're collecting fish to eat, those are dead, right? <laughs> so I always kind of thought about that when I was learning this. So we want a second method as well, obviously, um, which we call fisheries independent monitoring. And this is our monitoring program that we're going to get into. Um, so I think I'm actually going to, let's see, I'll show you guys a couple graphs. Yeah, I'll go quickly through this because I want to get to the, the other stuff. Um, so if we look at count by harvest, so how many are harvested, um, let's look at the New York State. So this is New York State. Um, this is actually showing you when in the year most of them are harvested. So even if it is open to fishing in April, not really catching them in April. That might be different this year. I don't know. If it gets earlier, that's another thing to, to think about. May is definitely the peak season. Um, and June, you know, kind of trails off a little bit. But you can see these have kind of roughly been, been going down a little bit every year. Um, you can also look at this on a larger scale. So this is commercial, biomedical, and um, the estimated mortality with the biomedical, which is this tiny little green dot down there. Um, but overall, from the 19, like late 1990s, um, this has gone down for sure. Um, and again, it's hard to tease apart from is it just that we started regulating it better, or are there fewer crabs out there? So that's why we definitely want to be making sure that we are counting them. So these are just some of the sample graphs that we've gotten from our, um, our own research, where we tag the crabs, we count them, we, we involve the public in this. And I'm going to get to how you guys can participate in it. So you can see, for example, um, Peconic Bay. This was a trawl survey, actually. Um, so this is 1987 to 2022, right? So this is actually going out, trying to catch them and release them. Definitely seeing fewer crabs. Um, the others are sort of mimicking that, that trend. Yeah, so this is something we monitor across Long Island, yeah. Um, and if you want to get involved with the, with the counting and the monitoring, you can, anybody, no matter where they live, they can access a site that, um, that somebody will be able to get to. I put this chart up, it's a little wordy here, but I just wanted to show you the new plan. So this is a little bit new for this year. They are going to um, close the fishery for some of these, uh, these peak spawning dates, right? So they have predicted, and again, this might be off, who knows if they're gonna come earlier, but they've predicted that this moon cycle, May 17th to 21st, and June 1st to 5th, that they're gonna be the peak. That's what we've been seeing in our data for the last few years. So we actually were able to close the fishery. You can't take horseshoe crabs during that time. So May, like middle May and the first week of June. So those moon cycles, the, the whole fishery is going to be closed. Um, and we'll, you know, hopefully that, that will make a big difference. And then you know, it allows people to still, still take, right? So outside of this, even in, you know, uh, that date might be supposed to be April 31st. I got this graph from somebody. So April, right, you can take 200. Um, yeah, and I think most of, the other, most of the other dates that are available, you can take 200 per day, that is, right? So an individual can take 200 per day. Okay, so this is the fun part for me. This is where we go out and we actually just count the crabs, we tag them, we kiss them on the face and we send them on their way. Well, I do that anyway. You guys don't have to. Do they kiss you, do they kiss you back? I mean, I don't know. Where is their... Yeah, I just kiss them right here. So, <laughs> um, so this program began in 2007. So three years after, you know, we really set that limit for New York State. Um, so relatively speaking, it hasn't been, you know, going for that long, which is why we still don't have answers to a lot of these questions. But we go out and we leave a tag on many of them so that we can actually uh, collect them again. Or if anybody ever sees one of these tags on a horseshoe crab, or even not on a horseshoe crab, if you see it just lying on the beach, if you see it on a turtle, it shouldn't be on a turtle, but look at it. Um, there is a number on it and... Is it a number or a website? Yeah, it's a website, right? So you report it to the website. And yes, you will get a pin for your contribution to science. Really, really, really important. 
Um, it's a nice little pewter um, horseshoe crab pin. So that is really uh, some, something that everybody can participate in. Um, and we partner with, you know, Peconic Estuary Partnership. The DEC is really kind of in charge of this whole thing. Um, Stony Brook School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, which is where I went to school. Um, Cornell Cooperative, right? So we work with a lot of people across the island to get this work done. Um, if you decide to come join us, what we will do is we go out and we record the conditions, right? So we use something called an anemometer um, to tell where the wind is coming from and the wind speed. We can take air temperature with that. We do the water temperature. We check the waves. Um, we check the, you know, the, the weather, right? So if it's raining, right? So we have all of this data to be able to tell do crabs take a break when there's a thunderstorm? Or do crabs you know, like to come out when it's a little cloudy? We don't know. We have to keep checking that data for that purpose. The other thing we will do, this might seem kind of strange, um, but this actually allows us to measure our own ability to see in the water, right? So if we've got all these different people across Long Island going out to count crabs, my eyes might be different than somebody else's. Maybe I've got a better flashlight one night and not the other, right? So using the good flashlight that you're, that you're bringing with you, you send this fun little dog toy, it's, you know, really technical stuff here, out into the water. It should go much farther than that. And you ro reel it in until you can see it. And then you're going to check that's how many meters of visibility you have. Um, and then, we start, we got moon, moon speed, wind speed, weather, moon stage, yep, did all those things. Then we will start our counting. Um, and so what we do, I'm going to kind of demonstrate this. I'll show you what we're looking for and then how we do it. Um, so we have to figure out male versus female. This is an easy way to get used to this. We have to figure out if it was submerged in the water um, or if we found it kind of washed up on the beach in the surf zone. And the, the main method we use is a transect line. Um, these, are, these vary in length. The one that I use at uh, Hampton Bays, it happens to be 250 feet. But a transect line is just a long line. So if I have now measured my, my depth perception in the water, I need to stay about there, you know, uh, from the shore, and I'm going to walk. And I'm usually walking with somebody recording, and I yell out, male, female, submerged, right? And somebody has to write it down. And this is how it goes. Um, and if we get good teams and groups of people together, it's really uh, nice. Sometimes you get to watch the sunset first, and then you're walking under the moonlight. It's, it's delightful. If it's raining, it's different, but it's still delightful. Um, and so you can see in this picture, you know, a pile of, pile of crabs, right? So what are we actually looking at here? So when we're counting, we have to figure out male and female, right? And I told you there's an easy way to do that. The easiest way, if you can pick up the crab and look at the bottom, is that the female will have normal pinchers at the top. You guys probably can't see this, but these pinchers kind of just look like all the others, little scissors, okay? The males, on their last molt, so when they get to about eight years old, they shed their, their skin one more time, and they will never shed again. They will never grow again. So I've seen adult mature males that are like this big still. They just happen to stay really small. Um, and they're out there doing their thing. Um, and on their last molt, they get their final claws. And those top two claws have these little hooks on them. Guess what those hooks are for? Got to hold on to the lady. And it turns out you got to hold on to her for like two months. So they better be really strong, right? Um, so that is the telltale sign of a male versus female. You cannot tell whether a baby is male or female. There's no way to know unless, I guess, maybe there's some genetics they could do, but you'd have to kill it for that. Um, the other way that you can get used to this, and it does take some time, is the females are always bigger than the males, um, especially by this point. And they're going to be arranged, so you'll see a big female, so if you, I think she's kind of like facing this way, her hinge is here, right? You can see the male that has attached onto her. So I could look at this clump and know for sure this is a female, this is a male. And any of these other small guys that are hanging around by their behavior, you can tell are males, right? So most of the time when you go out there, you're looking for big females with a male attached and, you know, loads of other males kind of hanging around. So that's another way we do it. 
And the more you come, the more you get used to it. The other thing we do is tagging. Um, so we're going to record whether it's a male or a female. Um, we take the size. Oops. So we use these big calipers, um, which get really gummed up in the sand. But they're nice because even if this crab is in the water, I don't have to pick it up really to get the size. I'm going to go to the widest spot. And I can pick it up and read uh, the measurement. Right? So a good tool that we use for taking the size of it. Um, and then the other thing that we're, we just started doing, I think last year or the year before, um, to try to get an idea of their age, we're going to start estimating their shell condition. Um, so they actually have these categories they've come up with. So a, a very fresh horseshoe crab, right, that maybe just sexually matured this year, just went through its last molt, going to have a nice clean shell. The shell almost looks a little translucent. Um, you know, it hasn't kind of hardened over. So we would, you know, categorize that as a 0% coverage. There's nothing growing on it and like a shell condition one. Um, and we're starting to, to include that. And then there's other categories like we'll say how many, how much of the shell is covered by epibiont. So other things living on the crab. You see this one's got a lot of algae on it. This one's loaded with barnacles. So the idea is that the longer they've been out there, the more likely they are to have gathered other things that want to go for a ride. Or maybe didn't know that they weren't on a rock, and then their rock started moving. Um, and then, you know, towards the end of a horseshoe crab's life, they're going to be covered in barnacles and things, and their shell is really dark and often has, you know, big punctures in it, right? <laughs> um, here's a good demonstration as well of where we tag them. So we always tag them on the, the left side, this corner. Um, this one definitely broke after post-mortem. Um, but you can kind of see it has an indentation here. This, this is hard. So this crab must have, maybe when it molted, it got bumped into something, and its shell kind of hardened in that position. Um, and they were able to, to survive. So that one's a pretty old one as well. I think we're getting close to the end here, and then we can do some interactive stuff. If you guys want to help us out and you see somebody during one of those dates, I'm happy to provide you guys with those dates of when it's closed and you shouldn't see anyone taking crabs. And if you see someone taking crabs, don't go harass them. We, want, we care about your safety. But you can call these numbers, right? So we have these numbers now. There's a, a daytime phone and then sort of a hotline. <laughs> Um, that you can call to report somebody that you think might be taking crabs illegally. Remember, in, in the season, not on those closures, they are allowed to take 200 a day. Um, there are some areas that are completely closed, like national, the, the Fire Island National Seashore, closed all the time. Um, so learning those kinds of things you know, can, can help with this. Um, and I think that's it for me. I have to thank some people for, for contributing some information to this. And if you guys do want to get involved, um, you can certainly sign up to help me out at my Hampton Bays site, which is coming up soon. <laughs> but if you live a little bit uh, farther away or if, you know, Pikes Beach is close to here too, they do some really interesting stuff there, um, you can go to newyorkhorseshoecrab.org. Um, and you'll be able to see the entire map. In fact, if I click on it, I can show you all the sites. So if you just go to sites, they just revamped their website, so it's nice. And you can see, this is how far spread all of these places are that you guys can actually get involved. Um, and as a special uh, treat, I do have a live horseshoe crab with me today. So I think that's about it for me, and I'm gonna let you guys come up and look at this stuff and see Mr. Crab. <laughs>